Um, I'll go ahead and call us to order then. Good morning. Due to the governor's recent order, all members of the Fair Planning Committee are participating virtually. For virtual meetings, committee members will be muted until asked to be heard. At that time, they will be recognized and will be unmuted. When there is a vote, it will be necessary to take a roll call vote. A committee member will be recognized and will raise their hand and state their vote. Today's meeting is a public meeting. Citizens can listen to the meeting if they contacted the city manager's office to make the necessary arrangements. The meeting also will be live streamed on the city's YouTube channel and a recording of today's meeting will be available by Friday, November 12th on the city, city's website. Do you want to do roll call attendance, Rachel? Yeah. Rachel Barron. Odell Cheek. Carrie Collins. Willie Combo, Sophia Griggs, Kathleen Garber. Here. Kimberly Gressley, Joseph Hanby, Karen McHugh, and Anthony Tank. Wow, I'm here. <laughs> All right, then. Well, we will go ahead and we cannot approve the minutes for the September 9th, 2021 committee meeting. So we will move right along to the 2021 Carolina Classic Fair recap. There we go. Well, good afternoon. Well, good morning still, sorry. <laughs> uh, there we go. Thank you, Rachel. Um, this, Kat, you've already kind of seen this memorandum from the um, commission meeting, last, the last commission meeting we have, and I'm just going to go over a few of our attendance and financial result, results from the memorandum. Um, overall, I believe that the Carolina Class Fair was a success this year just because we got to have it, and it was great for the community. I think everyone had a great time. We didn't have any, that many issues. Um, and overall, I think it was just great to be back since we didn't have it last year. Uh, this year, we did end with a 37.72% decrease in attendance compared to the 2019 fair. And um, that's with a final attendance of 182,048. And that's also about 34.6% below our previous five-year average. Um, our advanced sale admissions, they were also down quite a bit, 65% from 2019. Um, those were uh, made available this year through the Winston-Salem Dash Team Store, as well as offering the online print at home and mobile device sales. Um, we did have 98.78% of those ride re, um, advanced sale ride redemptions that were purchased. They were actually redeemed. Um, there was one Wake Forest football game played during the home, which probably had somewhat of a negative impact on that day due to attendance. Um, the total admission received decreased compared to last year. Um, the fair generated... 863,813, I'm sorry, 863,818,000 in unaudited gate and advanced sale admissions. Um, that represents a decrease from the 1.24 million from 19. Um, that will also be reduced by the 7% um, sales tax, and that's going to be reduced by about 56,500. Um, which is mandated by the North Carolina General Assembly. Um, we did have the, we continued our initiative with Ticketmaster. We sold the barcoded tickets that were scanned at the gate. Um, we worked with the Carnival staff to place the wristbands at the redemption centers. Um, they're, they're always a big hit, so that way they don't have to wait in the um, long lines for the redemption um, out on the midway. Uh, Straight Show paid the fare $777,424 this year. Um, that, re that represents about a 24% decrease in Carnival revenue, which is really not that bad compared to 2019 from the $990,399. 
Um, we did offer two new options with advanced sales with straights this year, a $25 weekday wristband and a $40 weekend wristband. Um, that helped disperse the, the crowds over um, less crowded days, um, which also helped with um, our COVID protocols that we initiated during um, this year's fair. The Carnival increased the everyday wristband price to $45, but continued the discounted um, $35 wristbands. Um, and this year we also, our sponsorship, we had 80,650 in revenue. Um, the police department, they reported few criminal incidents. So I do have a breakdown of that I can go into after this. Um, our, our attractions and entertainment, they were generally very popular. We had lots of good feedback from um, emails and um, Facebook posts on a lot of our um, roaming and um, grounds attractions. The country concert on Tuesday evening and, and evening in the grandstand helped drive that additional attendance. Um, that was um, to the concert and Monday night concert was Color Me Bad and Tag Team. They had about a thousand people come into the grandstand. And then um, Walker Hayes and Cooper Allen, that was 3,000 attended. And then our Andrew Ripp and Baylor Wilson concert, um, that was 1,500 also attended that one. Um, we had good attendance for our demolition derby, figure eight races, and the rodeo um, was very popular. They had a lot more contestants this year. Um, the Chronicle, they continued to sponsor our Gospel Fest on the Clock Tower. And um, also this year, that second Sunday, we added Jazz Fest, um, which I think went over really well. Uh, the Hispanic League sponsored our Hispanic Heritage Night on Friday the 1st. That was in coordination with the Hispanic groups and advertising. Um, our Cam Camel City Showcase that features a lo lot of our local artists. That was very well received. Um, the wine tasting, very popular. There was 1,062 people who participated in the wine tasting. 264 glasses of wine sold. 338 bottles of wine were purchased by fair guests this year. And um, our, also our newly formed beer garden, that did really well this year. Um, a lot of great compliments. Uh, we sold 5,051 beers. And for our souvenirs, we sold a total of 589 pieces of merchandise, resulting in about $8,208. So we did well on our new branding logo, t-shirts, hats, the variety of stuff we had there. Um, we also had a lot of discounted options for our visitors. Our welcome back promotion, the $5, um, that helped increase attendance from 2019. So um, that went over very well. The early bird special and we had 7,721 visitors participate in that between 11 and 4. Um, our crisis control food day on Wednesday, we had over 4,815 visitors and they brought in a little over 15,191 pounds of food. Um, that appreciation is valued at approximately 40,000 $455, and that will definitely help fill their food pantries and provide food for right here in Forsyth County. Um, WXII, again, sponsored our military day, which offered free admission. And they also um, plugged a lot with the Toys for Top, top partnership um, that we also had, that was also set up in the Annex Marketplace. Uh, the Winston-Salem Journal Family Fun Days, we, they offered the free admission that continued on that last final weekend. And we had 4,205 people in, um, enjoy those unlimited ride opportunities. Um, if you want to go into the WPSD summary, is that what you got up next, Rachel, or any certain order? There we go. Um, 
the police department personnel worked a total of 6,444 man hours. Over the 10 days of the fair, there was 28 incident reports. Um, as you can see, 21 of those criminal offenses, traffic related, and the remaining were the non-criminal in, nat in nature. Um, we did have 24 children or persons that were lost, but all of those were reunited with their parents or guardians. Um, we had 28 people ejected from the fairgrounds, uh, gang attire, drunk, disruptive. Um, but overall, I think that minimal issues, um, our gang officers, they took a zero tolerance state stance on the gang members displaying the gang colors and paraphernalia. Uh, we had drones that were deployed for the first time, and those were very useful with the police department. Um, they also assisted in actually apprehending three juveniles breaking into a car. So drone usage um, had really came into good play this year. The WBSD mobile command vehicle was deployed, and it was part near the command post um, that helped um, for them to have a place to run information and be able to hear the unit's calls. Um, and also our metal detectors were utilized for the second time for the fair with no issues. Does anyone have any questions on the WPSD report? Okay, uh, comparison. Okay. can't see it. I'm sorry, Rachel. I lost my thing here. <sighs> Give me a second so I can pull up my Sorry, I lost my version and I can't read the one that she's got up on the screen. <laughs> okay. As you can see from the comparison, um, the 10 year average took a pretty good hit with 2020 being zero. Um, that's, I guess, to be expected from the cancellation from 2020. Our total attendance this year, of course, that shows the 182. The paid attendance, 103,450. Our gate admission revenues were 863,818. Advanced sale gross was 91,948. You can see a big difference from that advanced sale from 2019. Carnival revenue, you can see that was very close to 2019 at 955,958. Our space rental fees, those went down some, um, quite a bit, 191,050. The total vendor revenue paid to the fair was $377,508. And our community food booth total gross was 11485 The main difference for that big jump there, um, we did only use um, booths 1 through 10. Yes, 1 through 10. Um, 11 through 14 were not filled this year. We had some um, plumbing issues in that building, and it also took down that bathroom in that building. Um, the next um, section are competitive exhibit entries. Um, as you can see, everything was down just about by half. Agricultural, 1,406. Livestock, 1,446. Poultry pigeons, 176. Um, our total, subtotal of agriculture was 3,028. Youth entries were down to 2,795. Flower show, um, we actually canceled the main flower show. Um, those 28 that you see there are from the professional exhibits that were in there. 
fine arts and crafts was 1,835, hobby crafts 489, antiques, senior and other 2,925, and just a combination of our under, other entries, 8,575, which left, left us with a total of 11,607. Um, our advanced cell locations, we had seven advanced cell locations. Like I said, we included the dash and um, box office. And I think there was a couple of other ways that was included in that also. Um, our advanced sale admission sold was 13,251. And the ride, band, brand, ride wristband and card sold was 11,515. Does anyone have any questions on any of those figures? Okay. Would we, so I know obviously with the fair not happening last year, that really messed up the averages. Right. Could we, and I know we had numbers for how many folks came through the drive through Could we include those at all or is that, just because it was a totally different event? I guess we could. Um, getting a Carol, good... Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe we used 2020 in the calculation. I don't, um, I don't believe we did. I think we yeah, used the 10 it, it years minus it. that column. So. Okay. All right, then. That's better. Because yeah. <laughs> zeros will mess you up real bad. <laughs> Okay, I guess the sponsorship sheet is the last one. Um, here's the listing of all of our sponsors that we had this year. As you can see, um, a lot of our special food contest sponsors um, working with um, sponsor source, they brought in T-Mobile and um, Verizon, Gutter Logic, a lot of the same brands that you had seen in the past. Um, we did have the new Johnsonville Sausage Big, Big Taste Grill. Um, they were out front for a couple of days. That was a new one. And then the Koi Pond, they landscaped the Koi Pond there in the village, um, Marsha and Luz. That was a great landscaping sponsorship for us also. And then the Beer Garden also was part of the... Um, sponsorship with Appalachian Mountain Brewery. So overall, our revenues are down. Our, we haven't really seen all of our expenses yet. We're still getting in a lot of those. Um, does anyone have any questions on the fair recap? How does the sponsorship number compare with previous years? Uh, we're down about... I would say about $30,000. We usually run about one hundred and ten to 120000 total. Okay. Yeah, Chevy, we lost that this year. Um, they did not come out. That was a big part of that decrease there. But we're working with other companies to increase that amount significantly for next year. Next year. And I know there were obviously still concerns about COVID and safety overall that yeah and you can see that throughout all the numbers. That throughout all like, the numbers yeah yeah the space sales I mean anyone who was here in the annex they seen the number of spaces that we didn't have available that were open um we had it wasn't just not COVID it was a lot of our vendors even spoke about just not having the help mm -hmm. the the labor issue really and the product and just get being able to get product. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you for all those numbers and looking forward to 2022 and heading back where we yeah. used to be. So, <laughs> yeah, but I think overall, considering we didn't have a fair at all in 2020, good success. So yeah, it's very, very successful. And the weather, it did play a portion too. Yeah. <laughs> Those rainy days and the newscasters the, were scaring it, it everyone off. <laughs> forecast of it's going to rain every day. Just kidding. It didn't rain.
So, yeah. All right. Well, we will now move to the marketing and public relations review. DJ. Hey, everybody. Um, DJ here with the advertising and marketing report. Um, let me share. Make sure you pull it up or do I need to share my screen here? Um, you can share your screen. All right. Your audio is a little distorted. How's that? Better. It's much better. And we can see you now. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it stays up. All right. And then I'll share my screen here on my desktop. Let's see. Can everyone see that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, again, DJ Hargrave um, with the advertising and marketing summary. Um, if you guys have any questions about anything, just um, give me a shout. Feel free, feel free to interrupt or you can wait till the end. Um, and if I have the answer, I'll let you know. If I don't, I'll follow up with the email with the answer. So our 2021 objectives were to engage the public through our hashtag second to none in 2021 theme, use media part, using media partnerships to do so, expand on current uh, existing partnerships, improve radio locations and partnerships, implementation of the WSJS Sports Zone and the AMB Beer Garden, and of course, inform the public about COVID-19 protocols. So over the next few slides, you'll just see basically a, a one sheeter of just our, our spins for um, different advertising avenues being print, radio, television, and digital. Um, you know, of course, our biggest one here is, the, is with the Winston-Salem Journal. Um, you could consider them our main print partner um, as they're the biggest newspaper around here. Um, and then, of course, with our partnership with them, you know, you had eBlast. Um, digital ads on their website, um, print ads in the newspaper itself. And then, of course, the Western Salem Journal Craft Wrap, which we had thousands of copies of. And you'll see it here in the next few slides, um, in the next few slides here, maybe even the, ne the next one after this. DJ, um, if I could jump in real quick. Um, the Western Salem Journal included the Greensboro News and Record. They are under that same umbrella. So those, those are for both publications. If I'm correct, DJ. Yep, that is correct. And you could have added that under our objectives too for 2021, which is um, kind of expand our reach into Greensboro with our advertising strategy. Um, Triad City Beat is our new, and I think our only new paid print um, campaign that we did this year. Triad City Beat is a publication based out of Greensboro. So that was a part of our uh, efforts to be able to do that. So here's the craft wrap with the Winston-Salem Journal. Um, th there was a circulation of uh, 30,000 on Friday, October 1st, on the day that it was released. And then we had 5,000 copies distributed at the clock tower at the Annex Marketplace and um, the, the, both of those information booths at the Annex and the clock tower. And if you want a physical copy, just stop by the office. I think we still have plenty. Um, so here are our radio spins, the number of spots and the reach of each radio station based on their uh, 2020 slash 2021 numbers. Um, some of our spins, of course, our biggest spins um, being with 107.5, KZL, iHeartRadio, and then actually where it says Intercom with 102 Jams, Simon and QMG. And you can also include the Wolf in that. They are now Odyssey. Uh, so moving forward, if you see anything that says Odyssey, that means intercom. And then our television spins, um, of course, with WXI being our official um, weather partner for the fair. And um, of course, the other stations we're all used to seeing, Fox 8, WFNY, ABC 45, and Spectrum. Digital, again, including, um, you know, our, our, our digital presence. Um, digital is becoming more and more prevalent every year. 
So making sure that we're staying up to speed on those, on those things with OTT, um, all the different streaming services. Um, you'll see YouTube TV, Bounce, Cord Cutters. There's so many things, in, and we're kind of learning new things um, as we go on about the digital space and all the different opportunities there and uh, where we need to make sure we have we have eyeballs on the fair, you know, on these different platforms. And then, of course, you probably saw some ads on Facebook and Instagram. Um, those all came from our Ticketmaster social media campaign, which they seem to just, uh, we really get blown up with the ads. So <laughs> we're hoping you guys saw some of those as well. One of our new partnerships was with uh, ABC 45 slash My 48. Every Friday night, they have the Friday Night Rivals game of the week. So every single Friday from August 27th, to even this past Friday, because it was the first round of the playoffs at East Forsyth, um, we were on site from late August until October, or excuse me, September 24th. We were actually selling fair tickets on site at the football games. Uh, we would try to grab a tent right beside ABC 45 tent, which is usually right next to the entrance or next to the concession stands somewhere with high foot traffic. We would be there selling fair tickets, um, giving out these cool green towels, magnets um and then all of course the, the the trophy was on display at the table and then the trophy that you see there with the carolina classic fair logo um it would be given to the team that that won that game so um basically our presence was on site selling tickets or just after the fair was over just being on site overall um before the game with the abc 45 folks um i would do a halftime interview and then at the conclusion we would present the trophy to the winning team, and then we would have a ton of ads running for the fair um, during commercial breaks during the game itself. Another one of our new partnerships was with the Winston-Salem Dash. Um, we have advertised on their Jumbotron previously, but we expanded upon that partnership um, to include selling fair tickets at the team store there at the Dash. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, in August, um, we were just at the games selling fair tickets and fair merchandise. And then throughout the month of September, um, we were at Truist Stadium at the team store pretty much during their, their operating hours, uh, Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday. And then this is just expanding on the partnerships and services, um, sponsoring Hispanics leagues. Fiesta, um, of course, Vela handling our um, social media campaign in the 30 days leading up to the fair. And this year that expanded to during the fair itself. And then, of course, they created our website um, and then with with um, Feisty PR. And I need to change that DC fair, the CC fair. Um, so the summary overall, we spent one hundred eighty thousand four hundred eighty seven dollars on advertising with a reach of over 11.4 million um, and over 12,000 total ads, marketing $47,432 for a total of $227,919. So getting into some different campaigns and also artwork and social media things, um, of course we had our big spin with Lamar billboards a total of $21,820 was spent on 23 billboards throughout Forsyth, Guilford, Yatkin, Rockingham, Wilkes, and Surrey County. This also included our This Is Our Happening Right Now campaign, um, which was a, a live feed to our digital billboards um, that was connected to our Facebook, letting people know what was happening during the fair. There's our wonderful chair committee, uh, uh, chair cat, <laughs> uh, jumping in front of the grandstand. Um, I've never been on a billboard before. It was big times. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty cool. Um, and of course, I was uploading that and updating that Facebook feed um, during the fair itself. So from the time that the rides arrived on the midway, leading up to the end of the fair, we were constantly uh, updating people on what was going on. Also, the sports zone. Um, so this was the first time that we had the sports zone. It was sponsored by WSJS sports hub, um, which I believe is the only sports radio station in the triad. So the sports zone featured wake forest athletics was Salem state 
the Carolina Cobras, which is an arena football team in Greensboro, the Winston-Salem Dash, and the Carolina Thunderbirds. Um, and it was located adjacent to the AMB Beer Garden, hoping to see some of that crossover from, um, you know, sports and, and beer, which go pretty well together. And actually, all of the ingredients that AMB used at their beer garden, it was all sourced from uh, local farmers for the Carolina Classic Beer um, itself. Also new, as Cheryl mentioned, um, we had the first annual jazz, jazz fest uh, presented by the Chronicle at the Clock Tower stage. Um, you know, with jazz being such a big part of the Winston-Salem community, we thought it was a good thing to include. Also, the Chronicle um, continuing with that partnership as well. And of course, we still had Gospel Fest um, during the fair as well. And then Cheryl also mentioned the $5 Welcome Back special. Wasn't really something we pushed too hard in August, um, in September, just because we did not want to deter people from buying advanced sale tickets. Uh, it was really something we kind of pushed out. Maybe you could say it a day or two before the fair started, um, just to kind of increase that traffic on the first Friday of the fair, which historically is where we've seen, um, the lower attendance on the first Friday of the fair. So now in the artwork, on the left, you'll see billboards and banner ads. Um, these were, of course, billboards that were on um, our billboards with Lamar, whether they were poster billboards or digital billboards. Um, you have our buckle in, personally, my favorite one. Of course, our second to none in 2021. And then our bigger, faster food year, which was exclusively located in Greensboro to get people to turn around from the fair in Greensboro. Uh, and come to Winston-Salem, or at least plan to come to Winston-Salem for the, for the fair um, once the one in Greensboro was over. And then, of course, we have our cart abandoners. You probably recognize these from 2019. Your tickets are waiting in your shopping cart. Come back and finish your purchase. So this was when someone would um, start a purchase on Ticketmaster and then did not finish it. We would try to reel them on back and follow them wherever they were, whether it was ESPN.com, Weather Channel, um, wherever it may be, to finish out that purchase. And then, of course, our generic digital ads which ran on our um, digital campaign with WXII on their websites, um, Ticketmaster, our Compass Media campaigns with um, social media marketing and display campaigns with them as well. Also, another thing we did with Compass, which I don't think I'll be able to touch on this later, was um, we did geofencing. So for specific events happening that we thought was you know, conducive to a fair crowd, you know, whether it was a Winston-Salem Dash baseball game, a Wake Forest football game, another fair, someone else, um, we would geofence for specific events. Um, and then individuals would get these digital ads pop up as they were um, browsing the web if they went to that event that we geofenced. So this is our COVID-19 artwork. To the left is our 2021 health and safety policy. You saw these all throughout the fair on A-frames, a lot of A-frames that are heavy. <laughs> and uh, I can't remember exactly how many we had. I mean, I, I think we might have had, I feel like it was 15 or 20, I, I feel like, um, of these all throughout the fair, letting people know, know, you know, that, you know, their health and safety is our top priority and just letting them know what they need to do to keep themselves and everyone around them safe. Um, in the middle, You'll see in the restrooms, we had these, your soap and water in 20 seconds, reminding people to wash their hands um, and do it the proper way. And then lastly, our feather flags, um, which welcome people to the fair at the bottom, letting them know that masks are required. And then outside of this welcome flag, we also had the uh, keep moving flag. And at the bottom of that one, encourage people to not congregate with people um, outside of their admission party. So some of our top Facebook posts, um, you know, and you'll see with these, and then also our other Facebook posts that did really well, um, and then our top Instagram posts, none of them were about food. Um, you know, in the past, we're used to seeing our top posts being about food, um, and I'll just be transparent. I think when we posted these kinds of images with the captions that were um, pretty generic, kind of encouraging people to come out to the fair, um, I think that's when people 
kind of took the opportunity to express their opinion about the COVID protocols and their opinion about the name change. Um, I think, you know, when we post food items, people are used to commenting, you know, hey, oh, this was awesome. I had it. Oh, man, I got to get out there and try this. Um, it was a little different this year. This year, the attention was more focused on our, what I like to call evergreen posts, posts that you can kind of use literally every year because they're not time specific and they're not specific to specific uh, food items. They're just crowd shots, overhead drone shots, shots on the midway, telling people, hey, come out to the fair, we're open. Um, and that's when people kind of took the chance to uh, blow up the comments, especially on Facebook. So they ended up being our best performing uh, social media posts because of that. Um, during the fair on Instagram, we gained over 250 followers um, and we amassed over 167,000 impressions. Here's our e-blast that we did. Um, the first one being the fair is almost here, um, which launched on September 8th, sent out to our email list of 59,903 people. We had 16,000. 903 opens. I forgot to calculate what percent that is, but I, I think that's a pretty high open rate um, for an email blast. And then we had 976 people click on the purchase ticket links um, that we had throughout the email. The second email that we sent was a few days before the fair started, plan your visit. Um, this was essentially an email letting people know about everything that was new at the fair um, and what they need to do to plan their visit. You know, the beer gardens here, you can still purchase advanced sale tickets, um, encouraging people to download the Carolina Classic Fair app. We also had our COVID-19 protocols in this email, letting people know ahead of time what they need to know um, as far as masks being required and things of that nature. Again, sent out to our email list of over 59,000 people, had 13,346 opens and uh, over 1,000 clicks on our purchase ticket link. And these last few slides, I'll, I'll kind of wrap it up here because these next four slides are honestly kind of a carbon copy. So what they are is um, our demographic breakdown of people that purchase advanced sale tickets, ride cards, and unlimited ride wristbands. Um, literally, but if I flip through, you'll see pretty much all of these look the same. Um, the punchline is that... Um, Individuals with an income of up to $75,000 made up the bulk of our advanced sale purchasers. Um, the vast majority of them were also people aged people age 25 to 44, with a good amount being 44 to 54, um, high school graduates, and of course, uh, the overwhelming majority of advanced sale purchasers had a child present in the household. It's pretty much 68 to 70% across the board, uh, majority female. Again, that number was the same for all the different fair items for uh, ride cards, unlimited ride wristbands, and tickets. It was pretty much 75% um, female, 25% male, which is something we're, we're, we're used to seeing. Um, and again, about 48 to 50% of the individuals that made those advanced sale purchases were married. So I, I think it's safe to say that um, the vast majority of them were people aged 25 to 44 with kids and are married. Um, and make up the $75,000. So it's always fun to see that type of information and be able to put our typical customer, um, typical patron, you know, kind of, into kind of like a box, which helps us uh, strategize for the future. And that is going to wrap it up for our advertising and marketing report. Uh, if anyone has any questions. DJ, do you want to talk about our TikTok and our Instagram reels? Or you want me to... Yeah, so um, I think we, we won an award for the best TikTok, I believe, um, with the IAFE Awards. Um, and of course, you know, our TikTok is, is new because TikTok is new. Um, Instagram Reels is also valuable as well. Um, so TikTok is, is essentially a video-only platform where you upload videos up to three minutes long. Um, there's all kind of trends and different things that you can do. Um, and so implementing that for, you know, our advertising this year was extremely important and Rachel really took the lead um, on getting our TikTok going and posting on there and also the same with our Instagram reels. Um, and, you know, we did the Walker Hayes dance, which was a huge trend um, right before the fair started and during the fair. I actually saw a commercial yesterday of the Walker Hayes dance on TikTok, so it's still really relevant. Um, 
And then of course, Instagram reels is, it's pretty much the same thing as TikTok. Um, it's just on Instagram. So, um, really important for us to be on those platforms, you know, to stay culturally relevant and participate in trends and just really get the word out about the fair through those platforms. All right. And now I'll pass it off to Shabon for our PR report. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. So um, I think the overall theme of publicity for the fair this year was that there was just an overwhelming pent up demand to hear stories about something other than COVID. <laughs> and so the fair came along at just the right time um, when people were getting very jaded about all of the messages that have been constantly bombarding them for a year and a half at that point. Um, so we had a, a very, very good publicity year. Um, you can see the comparison over the course of the last four years when I've been working on this business. Um, and you see the pent up demand and the number of stories that we received. I mean, it was, it was a shocking 1,023 stories. And what's interesting about that is that all of those stories were local, statewide, and regional. Um, so there were no national news stories in that number. Um, the 309 stories from 2019 hit 409 million impressions only because there were two associated press stories associated with the Legionnaires situation we were dealing with in 2019, as well as the stray bullet situation. <laughs> um, and so those impression numbers are for 2019 are, are very much skewed by that national coverage. Whereas this past year, we didn't have any national coverage and that's the amount of pent up demand the media had to write about the fair. So pretty extreme coverage. Um, if you break down the stories, you can see the breakdown, um, about 40 of them in, were in print, 118 in the web. Um, that one story in radio is not representative because there were actually 18 specifically arranged interviews on different stations about the fair. But because of how data is tracked and how we pull things, the radio mentions and the radio mentions are not mentioned. And so that impression number for radio is significantly higher, especially with the stations that we're broadcasting live like WTOB. Um, but the heavy hitter is, of course, um, television with 864 stories. That is a lot of stories. Um, it was a lot of interviews. I did 47 interviews in the first three days of the fair. It was exhausting. Um, and then a lot of those interviews were repeat aired, like Spectrum is notorious for a couple of interviews, and then they just roll all day long for days at a time. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing with those multipliers that happen in there. Um, we also distribute, write and distribute a lot of materials during the fair. So um, the goal is to give reporters stories to write about that we want them to write about everything from advanced ticket sales to wine competition winners to the press safety press conference to um, every day during the fair, the day before, there's a little story cheat sheet that goes out to the media that says, you know, here are good stories for the next day. And it features like the entertainers, but it also features different foods, different rides, different, you know, experiences in the buildings that they can experience. So that helps them, it helps us stay on the radar every day and it gives them something new to talk about every day, um, which definitely produced, um, the results that we got. Um, I did not do a um, positive, negative, neutral analysis this year um, because in literally every single story, um, I, I mentioned masks. You had to wear a mask, blah, blah, blah. Well, some people interpreted that as a negative message and some interpreted it as a positive message. And basically it cancels itself out 
any time that you ran the mask message up against whatever our positive, fun, like come to the fair and have a great time message. And so basically we got a whole bunch of neutral stories um, throughout the fair. So, um, I mean, literally every story was that pairing of wear a mask, we want you to be safe, don't be afraid, and then, oh, by the way, we have really awesome food. So it, it depending on your perspective and interpretation, um, I, I, I think, you know, I guess the city would be happy that we had so much mask messaging, <laughs> um, but I think it did, you know, deter some people from coming out to the fair. That being said, we generated about $11 million worth of coverage. Um, now, keep in mind that's down from about 12 million in 2019, but let's remember the 2019 had those two national hits that also jammed the numbers way up above what normally would have been. So this is some pretty significant um, value that came from all of the publicity. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions, but that's my very quick summary. And there's a much more detailed multi-page report that's been turned over to the fair folks. Thanks, that's good. Yeah, I appreciate all the detail and information. Y'all obviously spent a lot of time and <laughs> resources making sure that folks knew what was happening at the fair. Siobhan, thank you for surviving the 47 interviews. <laughs> oh no, that was just the first three days. Yeah. <laughs> and then it just continued. They did not get tired of doing stories about the fair. It's I mean, it was something new. <laughs> I, I have to yeah. tell you, I've also never been so wet on interviews <laughs> in my life as the day that I had Lainey Pope out and there was a tent that literally dumped a waterfall of water over the top oh, of us no. right before we went on the air. So it was awesome. fun. You know what, guys? Like, it was so much fun to, like, be out and at the fair and working with all of you and in a building and talking to people. It really was a, a fabulous experience. I am so grateful because I was, I'm seriously going stir crazy with COVID. <laughs> so <laughs> it was great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. 2022. It's going to be our year. That's right. <laughs> it's going to be great. Um, all right, I guess the next is the proposed fair planning committee meeting dates for 2022, which were an attachment that Rachel sent. So I hope everyone will have a very lovely holiday season and then we will gather perhaps in person together on Monday, February 14th. Um, and then moving on through the remainder of the dates, um, those will all be potentially in the Neil Bolton Home and Garden Building if we are no longer meeting online, TBD, um, with the exception of the fair walkthrough, we'll meet in the Special Foods Pavilion as we normally do. We would vote on these, but there's two of us here. So just put those on your calendar <laughs> and make plans accordingly. Um, is there any other business to discuss? No. All right, then. Well, I hope everyone has a lovely day and meeting great, adjourned. Uh, just, oh. <laughs> just real quick, great job, everybody. I, I, well, I've been, I've been here. You've been here. But. Uh, great job, everybody. I think, like we had talked about, there was just so many factors for this year. So uh, if the numbers weren't down, I would, I would have been shocked. So uh, fantastic job, job by everybody. And look forward to discussing the next next year's fair. I have some ideas percolating around, but we won't bring those up until we get to the <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. I think 2022 is going to be even better. Um, we'll hopefully be past all the things that we've been struggling with for the past 18 months and we'll be able to go on as normal, but better. So sounds good. Well, meeting adjourned and I'll see y'all next time. Thank you. Thank you.